This is a Full and Bloom interview with producer-engineer Alex Waltman. Inside the album, Wasp. Inside the Electric Circus. More info at fullandbloom.com. When you go into record Inside the Electric Circus, you've already worked with Wasp on The Last Command, and Blackie Lawless is producing this album himself. And so yep. how, how involved are you with the recording? It's myself and Dwayne Barron do all the drum tracking, and then Dwayne and I there for the sounds of the guitar, and then I was there for every performance on the entire album, every second recorded. I did that. So they just kind of brought Dwayne in. I know you said, yeah, can, like, Dwayne yeah, is... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Well, I was going to say Dwayne was kind of known to get the good drum sounds in that room. So is that what he was brought in for initially? Yeah, yeah, yeah for the most part. I'd say Dwayne was brought in to be the, the chief engineer getting the drum sounds up. Hill and I were there for the, all the tracking. And then after the drum tracking, Dwayne was, he was off to whatever project. And I kind of, from there, finished up the record. Dwayne might have popped in just to check something here and there and kind of see what's going on, but he wasn't there on a daily basis. So I did the rest of the record. And he's kind of leaving Pasha at this point, right? Let me think about that. He it would has, have been like um, 86, I think. He, he has left Pasha. After they track the drums for uh, Theater of Pain, Dwayne leaves Pasha and goes with Tom Worman to, what's that studio down on Melrose? So he left with, he left with Tom Worman, huh? Yeah, he, yeah, he was... He, left but no they, they go down to the, the studio which is on melrose down in melrose and western area down there killer studio he goes down there with the tapes and that's where they they do the guitars bass vocals everything else but the drums are recorded down there and i'm pretty sure it's just that studio but i think i'd have to look on the record to double check but almost for sure because i remember going down there a couple times visiting them one time i took a case of a corona down to the band i dropped a case of beer off down to motley uh, crew yeah and then then dwayne's gone from pasha at that point he, he doesn't come back and work with spencer anymore so then hans does the is the chief for the last command and then blackie knows dwayne so he preferred his work with whatever dwayne did before the last command i think and then Dwayne came back to start the circus record. But Dwayne was never, he was never going to be there for all the, re all the recording of it. Because, I mean, obviously it takes, we probably worked 50 hours a week on it. So Dwayne was never going to come back for that. So I, I finished up everything. And we went then from the Pasha A room into the Pasha B room and did all the vocals in the Pasha B room. Actually, I, it was really a very fun record to do. Describe a typical day. What time are you starting? And Probably start about 1. Maybe go to 9, 9, nine or so. Maybe 9, 10. I think there's some other times that black people are coming in, you know, maybe uh, 11, 11, 30, 12 o'clock. It might be 11 to 1 o'clock is the start time. And then we're finishing somewhere around the 8, 8 9, pushing it at times to 10 o'clock maybe. And then I remember a few nights, well, more than a few, going into the rainbow after our sessions, and which was fun. Doing some partying? Yeah, just it was always kind of low-key. Blackie never, I mean, I know they were considered kind of crazy yeah. back then, but he always seemed, I mean, for one, he's older. By the time he's making it, he's almost 30 years old. Yeah, so hold on, it's 86. He's got to be 32. As my, as somehow I think he's 32 back then, but I, I don't know. You, I mean, there must be a way to... I bet you Wikipedia. Well, there, there definitely is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think he was uh, 56 or something. He was oh, born. Yeah. Oh, I thought he was born before 56, but maybe that's it. Maybe he's 56. Maybe 30, that record was made. I just thought he was like 31, 32. Well, sometimes people lied. But I mean, you know, I talked to somebody a long time ago, Don Atkins, I think. He photographed Motley Crue at the very beginning, I think even right before Too Fast for Love. And he was saying that Mick Mars was like 40 or some shit when they made no. it in 83. <laughs> no, 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 Mars wasn't that though. He wasn't that old. I used to play, uh, every day I'd play Pac-Man at a sit-down Pac-Man table with Mars. And I would think, man, this guy's really good playing Pac-Man, but you think it's going to hurt your hand because if you play so much, you know, your hands get all tweaked. But I remember him being, let me see, that was 85. I remember him being seven, I always recall he was seven years older than me. But that would mean he was born in 53. I bet you if you Google him, if you put in there, I bet you he's going to come up 50. Three, 50, 52, three or four. But I'm going to bet 53, depending on the month, you know. But I was paying him for, he was seven years older than me. 
So he could be pushing 68 right now. So with Blackie working as a producer, I'm assuming he's the one who's calling all the shots as far as what take is what well, and all that? Yeah, he's calling the whole record. He's putting his vision down, and it was, it's coming together. It was a good record. I've heard stuff where he um, can be a control freak. This is the first album where they bring in Johnny Rod, which you already know him from working on Ready to Strike with King Cobra, right? Yeah, worked on both those King Cobra records. You know, I've heard some things with Blackie that he ends up recording over everything other than, say, the guitar solos and the drums. Does anybody play on the record? Yes. On uh, the Uriah Heap song. There's, <laughs> there's, there's the keyboard part. Right. Easy living? Yeah. All right. So Blackie goes to me, do you know anybody who could play the keyboard on this song? I'm like, yeah, I do. So I talked to a guy I know. He's a uh, I think he might have had a doctor's degree in music, and he he's like a, a very Christian guy. And so I said, and you know, he's try, he's out in L.A. And then his thing is not rock music, right? He's working on like different types of new age kind of stuff, you know, records like that, new age type music. You know, he's looking for make some money. Right? His name is David. You know, David, and I'm doing this album with this band. Um, <laughs> you want to play? Is you know, yeah, how much does it pay? And let's just, I think it's like 500 bucks, right? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. He goes, bring me a copy of the record or a tape or something. So I, I brought him a tape. And so Blackie's like, hey, you got this guy? I'm like, yeah. He goes, can I meet him? I'm like, sure. So I tell this guy, David, who was from my hometown. And that was my connection to him. And I like, hey, come come down, uh, gotta come down to the studio. So he comes down to the studio and he's written out all the notes of the Uriah Heat record. He, he's, he's charted it all out. Like he's listened to the record and he's written all the keyboard parts out. You know, and just does it by ear. And so he goes to Black, yeah, yeah, I get all set up here. Black he goes, you, you, you've written all the music for it? He goes, well, sure. And so he goes, okay. So he comes down and, Lays that thing down. I mean, Blackie was like, wow, that was really good. Do you want to have a, like a credit or something? He's like, no. <laughs> he didn't want to have a credit on the Wasp album because his, his Christian his Christian thing, his name is David. And then, uh, let me think, a year later, no. Two years later, he plays the piano at my wedding. He did a great job. So that was really kind of fun. And then I got a good one here, too. Okay, so you might know some pieces on this. We get done with the record, and I think, is it Benelli that, that's now, he can't go, okay, they're going to do the like Donington or some monster of rock or something in England. It'll be a big rock fest in the summer of, of that summer, which would be, eight, what, 86? And Blackie goes, uh, you, you, you know any drummers? I'm like, yeah. Oh, you mean Steve was, Riley was, couldn't go? No, yeah, you're right. Riley couldn't go. So Blackie's like, got to find a drummer. He's got, they're going to go play this big show. And so I, I would, you ever hear of a guitar player named Greg Leon? Of course, yeah, Greg Leon Invasion. I think, no, no, that, well, I don't know if it was the Invasion or not, but Greg Leon had something to do with meeting Molly Crew before they were signed kind of a thing. He was in so, Sweet 19 with Tommy Lee. Yeah, yeah, okay, so I met, do somebody, I met Greg Leon, and then in playing Greg Leon's band was a guy who I end up producing the Lizzie Borden record with Elias Solomon, who became my really good buddy for a while. And the drummer in their band was a dude named Kelly. Can't tell you the last name. I don't know it. And so this Kelly guy was like, man, he was one damn good drummer. Now he was, he's just in an LA band, right? Greg Leon's band, poor Greg never, never, never hit it big in his bands. Right. So I, I, I did some recordings with him and it just, it just wasn't quite good enough of a band, but this, this, uh, drummer guy is great. So Blackie goes, hey, you got a drummer? I'm like, yeah, I got this, this guy I could hook you up with. I said, but I'm going to give a disclaimer. I only know the guy from having him come into the studio and play drums. I don't personally know him. So I can't vouch for his character. I, and I was really clear because, you know, if someone wants a referral, you know, I'm only going to go off the fact this guy could play and he could play like no one's business. So Blackie's like, okay, well, connect me up. So I told this dude, Kelly, hey, Blackie Lawless is looking for a drummer to go to uh, this, I'll call it the Donington Festival, for lack of whatever else. I think that's what it was. And so this guy's, you know, this is like a big shot, right? He's all excited. And so I connect him up, and, you know, maybe a couple weeks later, 
I, I talk to Blackie, and he goes, hey, yeah, taking that guy to England. That guy's rocking, man. You, you call it good. I said, okay, good luck to you. You know, let me know how it goes. So they go. A few weeks or so later, Blackie comes in. I'm like, hey, how'd it go? He goes, oh, man. It went good. He goes, but I got to tell you. And he goes, well, and he starts kind of laughing. And he kind of puts his head down, puts his head, you know, shaking his head. I'm thinking, what the hell went wrong? And he says, they're getting ready to go on stage. And, the, you know, this is like the massive rock concert. There's thousands of people out there, tens of thousands. And he says, they're backstage. And they have like, you know, maybe 10 minutes to go. And he hears the crowd go nuts. And he, see, he looks up, he goes, what the hell's going on? Why is the crowd screaming their head off? And he looks around, and there's Donnie Rod and there's Holmes. He walks to the side of the stage and says the drummer is standing in the middle of the stage with his arms up and he's throwing the devil horns. And he's taking bowels right in front of the big crowd all by himself. <laughs> and so Blackie says, I go, what the hell did you do? He goes, I told the guys, get your ass out there now. We got to start. So he runs out there, and they, they play the set. He said the set went really well. He said the second it was done, he told his roadies, grab the son of a bitch and take him straight to the airport. So this dude named Kelly had his, had his golden 90 minutes or probably an hour. And, and what could you believe the arrogance of some dude who gets hired to go out with a, a you know, a, a internationally recognized touring band. And he's walked in front of the crowd of 50, 60, 70,000 people. And he's putting his arms up in the air like, look at me. To have seen Blackie's face would have been worth a million dollars. <laughs> and, then, and so I just, I just like, oh, dude, and I'm sorry. He's like, ah, you didn't know. I said, yeah, I, I remember I go, told you, I can't, I'm not going to vouch for his character. I can just tell you. I know a good drummer when I see a good drummer. You know, you want a good keyboard player? I'm going to get you guys going to play it like the record. I don't recommend people unless they are like spot the fuck on. But some dudes are a little screwy. That guy's a little screwy. So never knew what happened to Kelly, but I remember he had a hot girlfriend. I'm sure he's he's probably an insurance salesman now or something like that. Either that or he's dead. Yeah, it's one of the two. He's probably fat with short hair, you know, has some sales job. He's telling, he probably has grandkids now telling me, ah, I, I play with Wasp. Somebody would have pictures of him. He probably wouldn't have them now. But uh, I got to say, I said, I am not vouching for his character. I don't know the dude personally. He just came in and did these recordings. You know, he played like one or two nights. And I saw, I saw him play a show one time. And I'm like, man, that dude is really good. But I never, never really knew him. And then right after that, I guess, is when he gets Frankie in the band. The Headless Children or whatever. Yeah, but, but Frankie goes in the band to go on tour then. So then, then now Frankie's in the band. But Blackie sure gave him a hell of a good write-up. Yeah, that thing stood out where he was saying he's one of the first people I saw when I moved to L.A. And I just thought that guy's a bona fide rock star. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I give him, give him credit. He really liked Frankie and wrote a beautiful uh, piece for him. Yeah. And so what was it like working with Blackie every day? Absolutely great. He's the producer, he's the songwriter, he's the singer, he's the leader of the band, and he's the businessman. My relationship with him was absolutely professional and perfect every single day. It was a wonderful, great experience. He was always on time, always organized, always, you know, did do what he was gonna do and I'd set it all up and we do it. But it was it was fun. I, mean, I had a I had a really good time. And he made sure I got paid. Made sure I, I got my uh, I got my checks from Capital. And so again, Chris Holmes isn't playing rhythm guitars on it. Yeah, no, Holmes is in it. Okay, is Blackie letting Johnny Rod play all the bass parts? I need to think about that. Is, Rod, is, is Johnny Rock credited as the bassist on that? Well, he is, but again, I had talked to somebody and they had said that he kind of would go in and replace, including like Chris Holmes's rhythm guitar. So, but he may no, not have been was, doing was, that was, at that I, point. On that record, well, maybe on other records, but on that record, I was the guy. Right. That's why I'm asking. No. I mean, he, no. everybody I played their parts. I don't recall being replaced. Uh, I don't recall nothing like that. I mean, there was no redoing things and that. It's like he did his thing and that was that. Same thing on The Last Command. Did Randy and Chris play their parts? Yeah, I recall you, but there was nobody else, to my recollection, there was nobody else coming in the studio doing parts. You know, someone was sneaking in at night redoing parts. Or no, just Blackie doing all the rhythm guitars and the bass. Blackie did, you know, I don't I don't recall the, I gotta, I gotta look for, see if I have some notes. I, I don't recall on the bass. 
Blackie might have played a lot of bass, but he would not have he would not have replaced parts. I, I, there was no redos. But I, I, I don't think Johnny Rod started came in right away. I, I, I don't recall. But I remember Blackie. Blackie plays a good rhythm guitar. But going back, I mean, I watched Holmes in the studio get get guitar sounds up, play his part. So he was cutting the rhythm guitars in the studio. Yeah. Now Blackie could have played some rhythm guitars also, but Holmes is there playing on on, on the records, both those records. Holmes is a player. Is Chris hanging out at the studio, or does he just kind of come in and do his parts and leave? Not on not on the circus. He's not. But he was well, hanging out on the last command. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's like, Jesus, I mean, this is 32 years ago. Sure. But, you know, a lot of it's, you know, very impressionable because I was there. This was my job, and this is like a really cool job. And this is kind of like the job you want to you go for and you move to L.A. And so I was like, this is a good band to be working with, and I, I'm the guy there, you know, doing it. would have been really cool for me if I would have done the entire record, but... Dwayne was there in the beginning, which was really wonderful, too, because I learned to be a great engineer because of Dwayne. And any time I had a chance to work and learn from Dwayne, I was all over it. I'm like, I'm like, dude, be part, yeah. I get to be part of something you're doing. I'm going to get to watch and fine-tune my craft just a little bit more. Like, I think I told you last time, I have to give a in fact that I really – engineered some great records, great sounding records, not like, unfortunately, great multi-million selling records, but sounding, it's, well, my, my, my good ears, I thought, and the fact that Dwayne is a, a super great engineering teacher. So give him total credit. And so uh, yeah. why isn't Chris, I mean, are they kind of splintering off their relationship? I mean, do you notice no. anything like that? Or No, he was there for his stuff, and, and he would go. But the, the, the guitarist... I don't recall taking like any great length of time. You know, it's pretty straight rhythm rock. You know, it's really not that long, long of stuff. And what we really spent a lot more time with was doing the vocals. And the vocals are just, you know, one on one. I put up the AKG C12, and I think I put it through the focus right. And then it went to an LA2A, and Blackie sings. I mean, it was plug and play with the best equipment on earth to get straight to tape. And that's just how, that was the gear we had at Pasha. It was the best gear that you can get. And you plug that, it's a microphone's, you know, about, so you, you can't put your hand around it. It's a big, thick microphone. And it's about 12 inches or 14 inches long. It's called the big horse stick. And <laughs> ha hang the thing up there. Right. Put the windscreen on it. Plug it straight straight into the focus right preamp. From the preamp goes to the LA-2A uh, tube compressor and pop it right to the tape machine. And, you know, there was the vocals that went down and, Blackie would sing the vocals. Now, I've always thought, I mean, for one, his voice to me is amazing. I thought that guy could have been even a great thrash, probably the greatest thrash singer ever. But oh, I, I God, just, it's a good voice. Yeah. yeah, it's an amazing voice. And even live, I mean, he sounds exactly like the record. So I've often wondered how... Um, how he cut his vocals, you know, when I've talked to people like Tom Werman or Bo Hill, they had kind of a system where they would, you know, have the guy run through the complete song five times or three times, and then they kind of comp the vocals. Did you guys do anything like that? Yeah, comp the vocals. Now, other times you'd pu punch it in. But... And he'd just be sitting yeah, at the was... console with you, or would he go into yep. the room? No, we'd sit there and we'd kind of go through and, you know, do it. Then then I think a lot of times he'd go back out and go, okay, now I we comped a good vocal. Let me see if I could just do it now and go back out and knock another one down. Because you, you take bits and pieces of four vocal takes and you make a good one. Now you got a, you, you, you got a good one, but you can also hear the good one. So now when you hear all the bits and pieces, now you're learning what you did over four performances, which might have been over X amount of hours. Now you go back out and you could go, let me see if I could nail this down the way I did, the way I like it now, I comped it. Let me see if I can get one all the way through. So I might have done that too. So I, I can't recall all the vocals. I mean, they're not all one takes, but they're not all pieced together either. There's a lot, 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 of, lot of good singing. Wow, so a lot of them he would just do a full take and then maybe just punch in a few lines? Yeah, yeah, there was no, no, yeah, it wasn't like, you know, if you do a great one take, you don't have to punch much in. 
Or maybe you do a great take and keep almost all of it and take something from a, another take. Any kind of memory stand out from cutting vocals? No, other than overall, it was just a, a straightforward, professional, good creative time. No funkiness, no 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 you know, no weirdness. Just straight good good singing uh, on some I thought some some cool songs. Uh, and if you ever read anything about what he thinks of that record? Uh, you know, I don't. A lot of people don't consider that one a great one uh, compared yeah. to, because I know the next one is considered kind of like almost a comeback. I listened to it the other day just to get a refresher on it, but, you know, I was a huge Wasp fan on that first record. Then the second one came out and I bought it immediately. I liked it, but I was kind of on the fence just because he did some... In the video, he did that little Paul Stanley dance, and I mean, there were oh, just yeah, yeah, yeah. there were just some things that to me Wasp was like. That's why I always thought kind of a thrash band because they were disgusting. I think their angle was like a, a should have, yeah. And I know you can't stay in that forever, but right. I don't think that one sits too well in history. Even though when I listen to it again, there's some great stuff on there, but some of it sounds like kind of a rehash. Of of the previous albums. Yeah, it could be. I tell you what, the one thing I, it, it wasn't just this record, but just my taste in general. I thought that thing was too washed out with reverb. I remember first listening to it going, I, I don't get it. The rough mixes of that record, I mean, you know, you put it up with a little delay on the vocal, a touch of reverb here and a little bit on the snare, and it's just like power right in your face. And then this Wagner guy washes it all to pieces. Which is weird because Michael Wagner is a badass with Accept and that first great white release. Man, that shit's the shit. I've always loved Michael Wagner's work, but, you know, I wasn't going to say anything, but when I listened to it, I thought the drums, I don't think, sounded as good, even compared to the last command. It was washed away. The recording's phenomenal on that. It, too bad he, he didn't do a remix of the record. That would be okay. cool if he uh, did a remix of that, actually. I think it well, needed to be almost a little more aggressive sounding, a little more out front. Yeah, it did, but you know, that's how he heard it at the time, and he went with it, and kind of is what it is. Hopefully the tapes still exist. But it's one of those things, if you're ever going to remix it and do this, you got to do it now, because there's not all that much time left that anyone will even give it him. And if the tapes, if they've even survived, which they probably have. But I'm not even crazy. sure if he'd think it would be worth it. He, he, no, it, it wouldn't be worth it to go and pay some pay in book studio time. He, he probably would not do that much. Is Johnny Rod hanging around the studio at all, or is he not no, even there? No, I don't. I mean, I never remember Rod at many times would come in, but for the most part, a lot of it's just black and myself. And what was it like working with Johnny Rod on, say, the King Cobra records? Was he pretty oh, good in R the studio? Rod's a wild guy. He was, he was a hilarious guy. Kind of always over the top, you know, friendly guy, just very high strung, you know, high, hyper kind of a dude. It was just kind of like the life of the party kind of a dude. And as far as recording the guitars, I heard that Chris Holmes at some point would use like a little Marshall Mini. Did you guys do anything like that? I don't recall. Okay. I guess we could have done a, a specialty sound or overdub or something and just mic'd up the, you know, split it and run it, ran it to a big stack, then also to a little one too, and combined it. We used to do things like that, you know, put uh -huh. the amps away from each other and mic each, each one and kind of bring them up in a fader and blend them together. So yeah, it, it could be, but I mean, it wasn't like that was getting the sound or anything. And what kind of board was that, Pasha? MCI. MCI board. No other studio had that. Only, for whatever reason, Pasha had it. I was there and I, I organized getting the equipment for the second studio when they he upgraded the second studio, and he got on the exact same board. And, you know, I'll be damned, that board, that sound of those, those records down there. That was a, it worked. And the same uh, same tape machine. Everybody else in town is using the Studer, and Spencer has the MCI. Was the MCI what recorded Metal Health? Yep. that That's what was there since before I went to work there. That was there the day the place shut down. Spencer sold it to the guy Jerry, and then Jerry had it until he just parted out the gear, and that was it. What year was that? Was that like at 90, right at the end of the 80s? Yeah, yeah, it might have been. It could have been, you know, it could have been 91. I don't know. I lost track in there somewhere. It crossed into the 90s. So I left in like October of 88, and Spencer had it going for a while, 89. Yeah, Spencer probably 
sort of around 1990. And why did you leave? I just went to work. Uh, actually, I just went to work for myself. And he wasn't getting any more bands, and he was looking to do other things. And it was like, I want to put together some sort of like bigger music company, or I had some other aspirations. And I like, I was in the thick of one that worked with rock bands. It's like, well, shit, you're not bringing any rock band in here and you're not doing any projects. Why is the studio open? And someday you're going to walk in and go, I'm closing it. Everyone fend for themselves. You're out. So I'm like, I'll, I'll beat you to the punch. I just got a project and took off. No hard feelings. There wasn't, there wasn't any, any business going on. He stopped. He could have kept that place going and turned it into something really great. But I guess it wasn't what he wanted to do. And I'm assuming uh, Steve Riley always seems like a very solid drummer, so I, I'm assuming he was yeah. great to work with. Riley's a good guy. Drum tracks were easy to get. But, you know, I'm thinking... God, I don't recall... Yeah, the drum, drum tracks was, was... Yeah, that was all, all straightforward. You know, and that was Dwayne's Pasha drum setup, which I ended up using it many times. But I mean, it wasn't like it was pretty. It was just made sense, and it was a good, good sound. And put the drummer to the back, to the so when you're engineering, you look out, you see the drummer's head, and he's facing the same direction you are looking out into the room with his back to the window. That was the the way the drums were set up. That's something Dwayne had figured out that that worked good. And, that's just how everybody did it. Any Chris stories that you remember from back then? No. Okay. <laughs> Nothing that sticks out. Okay. You know, other than just, you know, coming into work. I mean, we really, we're, you're not talking any wild studio times. No crazy stories, no, nothing out of the ordinary. Just straight coming okay. into your job, doing your business, and getting done with your part, and that's it. No partying at all. Nope. Did you ever record a band where they were getting shit hammered in the studio? I recorded lots of bands where it was beer and pot. That was it. In my re rest of my career, I never had any anything other than beer and pot in the studio. And especially when I, I was the producer on it, I sure didn't want to see anybody getting screwed up because that's valuable studio time that goes down the toilet. Of course. That, you know, the budgets of the bands that I ended up working with, there was no time to have wasted a day or two. A lot of hours going down the tubes. But, you know, people smoke pot a little bit throughout the day and, and beer at night. Would Spencer give, like, a different rate for a month? It looked like Inside the Electric Circus was cut in a month, recorded in July of 86. Yeah, it wouldn't have been just a month. It would have... It, it, it would have crossed over into August. And so, what would what would he charge? Like, I mean, is it like a would he give a different rate or kind of a deal that Blackie's coming back to him? That's a good question. I have no idea. I, I know as Blackie would have cut a pretty good deal, and Blackie's deal included that I would be the engineer from Pasha. He struck a good deal on his studio that worked, and he struck a really good deal making sure that I not only got paid my salary. But I got the Bill Capital Records too, and, and that made a difference in me getting the house the next year. Nice. It wasn't wasn't like massive money, but it was, you know, it was sizable money for thirty two years ago. I made a good good little pile that that summer, and that that was a good solid businessman, Mister uh, Steve, right? Steve uh, Duran. Oh, Steve Duran, right? Yeah, just an honest guy. Oh, that's cool. That was a low pressure. Very fun time in my life. You know, I worked with some good people. That Wasp record was a pivotal record because you know he paid fair, and it was a it was a great experience. No issues. You know, technically no issues. Not like you know something got screwed up. You know, you hear about people's things go weird in the studio or something, nothing like that. And um, it was straightforward. Two. 